So we're now looking north up the lower coulee. We're looking north up the lower coulee. And, um, and what we see is, that, so this deep cut in the ground that is the coulee was made by the floods. Yes. Before the, before the floods, there was just a continuous landscape here. Across there, yes. A yeah. tilted landscape across from left to right. And then this 60 mile an hour gushing. Came through, yes. Yeah. Exploited. Flow came through. With the flexure of the of the rock, yeah. it created zones of weakness, right. fracturing. Okay, the so floodwaters exploited, the exploited the yes. Gotcha. And those cliff faces there are about 900 feet high at the top. And then you'll see there's a series of hanging valleys in between. It was the pre-flood drainage topography, but now that's been completely disrupted. So now I don't know how. I don't think too many of them are active. But you know, when you get a good rain, then there will be waterfalls coming out of each I one see. of those. I see. Yeah. yeah. Each one of those. And you know, typically, if you look up hanging valley, it'll show you pictures of glacially sculpted hanging valleys. Right. But what this shows you here is the catastrophic floods can also create hanging. Valleys. Right, right. Yeah, so beautiful. Fields. So the flood, the, the main flood is rushing through the middle, scooping out everything underneath it. Yes. But the, there are waters coming down from the sides as, as well. Is that I right? would think so, but not nearly like the flow that's being concentrated in the coulee itself. Right. The water coming out of the coulee at the head of the flood would have risen. At, at the, the peak level. of the flood would have been probably right at the level of the hanging valley. Right. And initially, of course. And how high are they? Well. They're probably six to seven hundred feet because right. the, the whole cliff face is about nine hundred feet high. Yes. You see how there are actually piles of gravel yes. halfway up, two thirds up. Again, that's if you can picture a water flow. Yeah. If you've got a channel like this, uh, a hydrologist refers to the wetted perimeter, right. which is the total length of the contact zone between the water and the channel okay. surface. That's the wetted perimeter. As the channel gets shallower, the ratio between the wetted perimeter and the width channel width approaches one. Right. You see, as the channel gets deeper, yeah, like this, then the wetted perimeter gets much greater than the width. Right. So th that kind of concept applies very much to the idea of the of the dam, the glacial dam, because in the glacial dam. It, where we will be passing through the Clark Fork Valley, the base of the channel of the valley is five miles. The the height of it is at, at where the water level was was seven miles. Right. So the wetted perimeter is actually probably nine or ten miles. Right. So by implication, then you had to have nine or ten miles of perfect seal right. between the ice and the substrate. Right. Right. It's calling for a lot. It's calling for a lot. Yes. Yeah. And when we were at uh, at Mount St. Helens the first day, where I was talking about somebody in the lake with a little bit of background, she says, well, I said, you know, it's just implausible that the, the glacier ice could retain water yeah. at that kind of pressure without leakage. Yes. And if there's any leakage, it's going to undermine the dam. It's going to undermine the dam. And she says, well, it was probably really, really cold. And I said, well, okay, let's sur surmise for a moment that it really, really was cold. Yeah. Then where did all the water come from? Yes, exactly. That, that, there's a double bind there. There's a double bind there, yeah. You can't it's have- It's cold enough for the water not to undermine the dam. Then, then it can't be water. It can't be water anymore. Yeah. I like that, yeah. And, and the water, there's only two sources for the water, rainfall or meltwater. Yes. And either one of those is incompatible with with the dam theory. When now, they envisage these ice dams, how thick do they think they are? This one's got one that's nine miles long, you're saying, or seven, seven miles long. Well, seven miles across the valley, yeah. and I can show you on the map, here comes what's called the Purcell Trench. Yeah. Clark Fork River comes in at an angle like this. The theory is that the glacial ice, and there, I'm sure there was glacial ice, that came down the Purcell Trench, blocked off the flow of the Clark Fork River, and extended they estimate 25 to 30 miles south right. of that intersection. Right. And then the water began to back up into the Clark Fork and back, backed up hundreds of miles into western Montana and right. rose up to 2,100 feet deep against the dam. Right. I, with my first trip out here, I went and interviewed a geologist who had done the most work on the site 
of where the dam was supposed to be. Right. I couldn't get him to commit to even telling me where exactly was the glacier water interface. Right. At the end of our 30 minute talk, he kind of in a way almost threw up his hands and said, well, he just didn't really even know about the ice dam. Right. Almost as if privately he's willing to admit that there's something wrong with the idea. Yeah, something yeah. wrong with the idea, yeah. And that was encouraging to me. That, you know, because, you know, you think of something and it just, okay, this doesn't make sense to me, but, you know, all of these geologists are saying that's what it is. Saying that's what it is. Then you start talking to the geologist. You know, we've been on multiple, you know, geologist guided field trips out yeah. here. And, you know, as soon as you try to pin them down, then they, right. they're they not so sure. Yeah, because it's a, it's a very flawed theory. There's, there's all sorts of weaknesses in it. Yeah, and, and that's where there seems to now be this rivalry between the Canadian geologists and the, and the American geologists. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Because the Canadian geologists are like John Shaw. He did a paper which I have with me in case yeah. you'd like to read it. It's okay. called Back to Brett's. I think it was John Shaw was I think was the, the lead author. But um, basically it's it's arguing that there were other sources of water than Lake Missoula. Now right. he doesn't really attack the ice dam theory. He right. merely says there were other sources of water. Right, right. But once you follow the implications of that idea, then it certainly does call into the question the idea of a glacially dammed lake. Absolutely. And then, of course, you know, as we look back to the south, all of this is going to be deposits over here. Yeah. And if you were to dig down in it, it would be nothing but boulders. All the way down for yeah. a couple of hundred feet. Yeah. Okay. Right.